Our next and last speaker for, for this morning is Evelyn Resch. And she's going to talk about something sort of near and dear to our hearts, probably. So I'll just make an assumption that everyone here in this audience has had sex and would probably like to have a little more sex. And um, today, well, today and not on stage, hopefully. But um, I, I spoke to Rand, uh, Randy Olson a bit last night, and, and he's a bench scientist that went from bench science into theater, or at least um, to learn about the theater. And I asked him what are the things he learned. And he said that as a scientist, they find it's difficult to communicate often, and I'm here to attest to that. And so he said he learned that the most important way to communicate is with your head and with your heart and with your gut and with your, to quote the Venn diagram, with your junk. So I think that that's going to be the discussion with Evelyn today, and I'm sure this will be the, one of the highlights of this wonderful morning. So uh, can people hear me? Yeah. So it's, it's really wonderful to be here. I have had um, a day of incredible trepidation because after all, I'm not really a scientist. And someone asked me if I was uh, a researcher. Um, I'm not that either, but I am a keen and compassionate observer uh, of human behavior. And I believe that that really is where all research starts. So if anyone hears my presentation and then wants to fund me, by all means. Um, okay, now is it? Where's my tech gal? It, is it this one going to the right? Excellent. OK, uh, just so you know, this is not an image of my breast or my bicep, um, but I use it because it really is so dramatic and beautiful. What, we're gonna talk, what I'm going to talk about today in large part is what is our relationship to sexuality? How do our psychologies um, interfere with our sense of desire? And what are your personal pleasure indices in life? It's one thing if you say, I have a happy life. It's another thing if you say, I have a pleasurable life. And I have sacraments that have to do with pleasure. And I maintain them every single day. It's my contention that the higher your pleasure indices are, the more of a sensuist you are every single day, the easier it will be to move into your sexual self. Um, think of your pleasurable life as a lubricant. <laughs> no pun intended. Uh, or every pun intended. Um, OK, when I work with people who come in to see me for sexuality counseling, what I'm looking at and what I'm assessing every single moment are the markers of their emotional well-being. This is true for men or women, regardless of what their um, expression of eroticism is. What are their feelings of competence and self-esteem? Uh, you know, all of us have those knocked around periodically because we come across things that are situationally stressful. But sitting with someone who has that knocked around because of a circumstance is very different than working with someone who lives in a state of self-loathing. People who live in self-loathing have no access to their sensuality or their sexuality. Spiritual satisfaction in my paradigm, this new paradigm of looking at where desire comes from, is this fabulous... Oh, double helix, there's my genetics, um, if you will, of uh, a combination of optimism and faith. And even though those might feel really um, very difficult to grab a hold of, when you are living with spiritual bankruptcy, you know it. And it has to do with a loss of both optimism and faith. Hell-seeking behaviors, do I look for 100%? Definitely not. I want to see 70-30 or 80-20, that 70 to 80% of the time you are conscious of health-seeking behaviors, and the other 20 to 30% of the time you really enjoy eating ice cream out of a pint while you're leaning against the kitchen sink, and that's dinner, okay? Um, being self-assured, it's not the same as having a sense of competence and self-esteem. Self-assurance tells me that when things are difficult, when you have completely blown it, which all of us have, especially those of us who are parents, <laughs> uh, you can say to yourself, I made a mess of this, and I know how to correct it. The first thing for me to do is acknowledge that I did make a mess. The second thing is for me to apologize and then go from there. Self-assurance is a very important marker of emotional well-being. Creativity, will you be Georgia O'Keeffe? No, you will not be. However, some of you are fabulous knitters, and those of you who are scientists are greatly creative, and some of you have beautiful perennial beds. Creativity infuses our lives with meaning. It gives, gives us a sense of purpose and pleasure. Uh, it also gives us a signature that other people notice when they recognize us in the world. And compassion and empathy, if everything else had to be off this list, Compassion and empathy would stay. 
because it's what makes us human and it's an incredibly important part of sexuality. And if you've ever been involved with someone sexually who lacks it, it's really destructive and it's a terrible, terrible feeling because you become invisible. Now, what happens is when you have these markers of emotional well-being intact, it's my contention that you are a deeply sexy person. And sexy has nothing to do with how you look, as we saw in the first presentation of the day, I say. And also, um, you have an enormous amount of power. And we often think of the word um, power and being powerful in life as a pejorative in the English language. It is not. It means that you are empowered to access what you want in the world and be able to create the life that you desire. Now, what happens is when people lose that sense of empowerment or feeling powerful and they can't access pleasure from their world, what they often will do in sexual relationships is they'll resort to means that are coercive in nature. And that's what I deal with so often when people come in and they say, I have a loss of desire or I'm engaging in sexuality that is meaningless to me. And it's my... Uh, paradigm really that power and coercion don't hold the same source, the same potential as sources of arousal and eroticism. Powerful people, truly powerful people, have those markers of emotional well-being well balanced. They can access them. They can write them when they get knocked around by what life presents to them. And because of that, they are sexy. They are truly sexy and they have an enormous erotic quality. Now, in relationship to, uh, or in relation to intimate relationships, we're going to talk about features of coercive sex first, how it shows up. Um, remember, you know, I could spend an entire semester on this, but this is a water bug's approach to how I work. Now, features of coercive sex, no one has come into my office looking like this yet, but it's just a matter of time. Um, women and men both, this slide really should be amended, who say no to sex as a way of controlling it. No. I don't, want to I don't want to have sex, I don't want to kiss you, I don't want to touch you, I don't want to talk about it. And then they leave their partner adrift, abandoned, untethered. And if you're the person that's saying no, 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 you are the person in charge. But it's a coercive tactic because if you have a beloved who is longing for you and you keep saying to them, no, I don't want you, they will stay away. But that's a coercive technique. Men who demand sex and increase the rate of demand often will do this because they're anxious. Because men, bless your hearts, you can live in your bodies and when you feel sexually aroused, you stay put. Women, we drift. We drift and we talk. This is our means of communication. Men commun communicate through their soma. Their physicality is their tool for communication. What will happen in heterosexual relationships is if there's an enormous amount of tension in the couple and men don't feel that they can discuss it or if women are over discussing it, men move into this place of anxiety and what they want to do to fix it or to apply a salve is they want to make love with us because that'll fix it, right? Well, you know, women will say, I want to talk about it. This is a death knell for men to hear. Oh my God, you want to talk about it again? Oh, God, not that. Again? We've already talked about it. Let's just have great sports fucking about it. That'll cure it. I know it will. Okay, well, I know I'm the only presenter who's going to say some of the words I say, but that's all right. Okay, <laughs> mutual feelings of dissatisfaction in these situations. I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer. No one who's dealing with this sort of uh, dynamic is happy. And then making sex a currency in the relationship. Now, what I mean by that is when couples get into complicated places and they do things like, you know, if you would give me a blowjob more often, uh, I would take you on those trips when I travel internationally to present at conferences. Ooh, I mean, that's ugly. And when it comes into my office, it's very dicey and it's painful and people are really, you know, in complicated places, as you can imagine. Now, in contrast, let me just give you a little important insight into how my brain works other than what you're hearing. At least once every day, just to entertain myself and because I'm a hopeful and faithful person, I close my eyes and imagine that when I open them, I will look like either one of these people. And I don't really care if I come back looking like him or looking like her, I'll take it, okay? Because to me, these people are about as hot as it gets. Now, the features of powerful sex as I see it 
are uh, safety and pleasure in succumbing to one's partner. Because when your beloved says to you, baby, I am so in the mood for, and let's say it's what I call James Bond sex, which is the kind of sex that you have, and if you died from it, you wouldn't care. Um, if you're not in the mood for that, but you want maintenance sex, which is what you do to make sure everything just is still there and it works, you can say to the person, I, I'm just not there tonight. I'm just not into the James Bond, Bond mood. Meet me over here and then we'll make a date for James Bond, etc. Um, because your self-esteem is sturdy enough and you can access pleasure in saying yes. Riding the wave of the unexpected, here's the problem. For long-term couples especially, if you do the same damn thing in and out, literally, every single time you have sex for 45 years, you are going to die of sexual ennui. Therefore, you have to be open to some of the suggestions I make to people, like sex toys, which are sexual enhancement tools, like fantasies, like maybe with some of my couples bringing in another person, because it spice things up, spices things up, but you have rules around it, whatever it is. You have to infuse your experiences with the unexpected because that's what keeps you interested and it affects brain chemistry. Mutual participation should not be confused with both members of the couple doing the same thing. If you like to be spanked really hard and your partner says, right on sister, you know, that's great. But if somebody's spanking you and you don't want to be spanked, then we've got a problem because you know what's operant? Coercion and you're not living with high pleasure indices, you're living with sexual torture, and that's what I'm gonna address when I talk to you. Lasting desire, in my paradigm, I believe, is a natural consequence of this. It has nothing to do with age, it has nothing to do with frequency of sex. Um, willing surrender, again, take me, I'm yours. I can manage myself in this setting. And participation without feelings of shame or embarrassment. Now with this one, you have to throw it out the window to some extent, because we are a very shaming culture, deeply shaming, and we have all kinds of rules about how people's bodies should look. And my favorite uh, example of this was, I was reading in some medical literature, and I, I'm a freelance clinician, so I do all kinds of things, and um, so I'm keeping track of STD stuff all the time because I work in a public health clinic that focuses on sexual health and, and diagnosis and treatment of STDs. And that the vast majority, I mean, imagine this, the vast majority of clinicians that were interviewed for this very large study, and it was nicely done, said that they do not do uh, uh, sexually transmitted test, disease testing on their fat patients because no one would want to have sex with them. Now, fat is a subjective term, and I have no problem saying to you, since I'm standing here, I'm fat and I have a lot of sex. Okay, and so I would hate if I were at risk for an STD for someone not to test me because I wear women 16. I mean, that just seems like terrible medicine to me. Now, meanwhile, you know, what I look for with shame and embarrassment is how much of it is there. Is there so much of it that the person can't just move into being sexual and enjoying their skin and the skin of maybe one or two or three, my patients do all sorts of things, people, um, or, you know, can they put it on the bedside table long enough to have a blast and then they pick it up after? Because, you know, it'll come around. I mean, you don't have to worry about that. Now, we're going to break this down into the differences in gender. And these are important things to think about. In this culture, in many cultures, people use intercourse, as, as heterosexual people use intercourse as a single measure of sexual success. And with men, if they choose, to choose an alternative to intercourse, or if they are experiencing because of natural aging issues or because of disease, uh, erectile disappointment. Because no one in my practice has erectile dysfunction. I hate that term. Your penis is not your most important sexual organ, your skin is. And that's what leads to the neurochemical changes that make you sex stoned, which is that your oxytocin goes way up, your norepinephrine goes way up, you are all science people, you know this. Okay, meanwhile, what happens is if people choose alternatives to intercourse because they have no choice but to do something else, this is what's at risk. They don't feel sexually competent. And this is a crisis, especially now as we have an aging population and we have an epidemic of erectile disappointment. Now, remnants of poor and or limited sensual training in childhood, you know, in this country, we do not teach men to be sensuists. 
We just don't do that. Now, I grew up in a Greek household. We are the ultimate hedonists. And um, with my Greek friends and the men that I grew up with were very, very sensual people. My American friends are much more standoffish, you know, and they, they, it takes some time to get used to me when they first meet me because I touch people all the time, I effervesce, you know, I spill, you know, all sorts of things. But this is a problem, and you know, when you're talking about men and trying to help them move into their sensuality, it's really a problem. It's a crisis. And so you have to remember that touching and affection, this is a language, and it's easiest to learn like any other language when you're a child. If I had to try to learn my Greek now because I spoke, up, I spoke uh, Greek before English, it would be a nightmare. Now it just comes out of my head, and sometimes I'm even thinking in Greek. And then I notice that it's the other language that I know. Um, Pressures from partner and or culture to behave within the confines of a prescribed role. We chain men to their professions and to their desks. And God help them if they're successful, because then we never let them leave. And if you think that keeps you happy and helps your sense of desire, you're wrong. Because if there's anything that's going to wipe out a man's libido, it's going to be when he's stuck behind a desk that he doesn't want to be stuck behind, and nobody in his life will let him go. It's a terrible thing that we do to men, you know, and if men are creatives and they say, I don't really care about the money, money's not my master, we want them to seek psychiatric care. Now, with women, oh, God help us, you know, this is a major crisis. Now, notice with this slide, you know, this woman's body looks bigger than the room. Well, that was very deliberate on my part because that's how so many women feel about their bodies. They feel colossal, they feel dysmorphic. This is a terrible problem, and I'm seeing more and more serious consequences of this in my GYN practice across the board, except with many of my Puerto Rican clients whose uh, body image is very different. They like to be able to grab flesh, and that's very satisfying to me uh, as a full-figured clinician, but I don't see this very often. And this this impact of poor body image is dreadful. These are women who are not going to enjoy sexuality, not have very high pleasure indices, not be able to move in to that sensuous place. The person who taught me the most about this slide and this content was my daughter because, um, interestingly, uh, I had my daughter through AI, um, a completely anonymous donor, and the joke in uh, our family, because this happened all the time, is people will see my daughter and they'll, it's just reflexive, they'll say, that's your daughter? Like, how could that have happened? She's a knockout, okay? She's got this beautiful body. She's a, a professional hoop dancer in an art circus. You know, people do run away and join the circus. My daughter did. Um, <laughs> She does some other things too, but you know, anyway, she also has the shortest fuse of anyone I have ever met. She has such a hot temper. And so I had to learn how to infuse my daughter's life with a sense of empowerment, not shut down her rage because it was actually quite motivating, and absolutely not shut down her lust because that was not going to happen. That was not going to happen. So what happens for women is if they move into their self-empowerment and their rage, they're bitches, and it's always because of an endocrine malfunction. Okay, You're a PMS raging bitch, you are a pregnant bitch, you're a perimenopausal bitch, you're an old hag bitch. I mean, how, I mean honestly, how much power can people's ovaries have? All right, now the other thing is, if you move into your, into your lust, then you're a slut or a whore. I mean, these are really crummy choices. So if you're mad and you're lustful, you're a slut bitch or a slut whore. So, I mean, this is, this is not a good thing. So for those of us who have lustful, hot-headed girls, we need to just stay really calm because, you know, as a midwife, I always say the only emergencies there are is if someone's bleeding to death or their shoulder is stuck behind their mother's pubic bone. Otherwise, nothing is an emergency you sit there, you try to educate your girls about how to deliver their lust and their sense of empowerment constructively, so more and more people will hear it. Oh yes, well, here's a problem, the Madonna versus responsible mother trap. This is what we refer to in, in medical anthropology as a culture-bound syndrome. Now, in the United States, if you are a sexy mother, you are a slut mother. 
And mothers are not supposed to be the people who educate their kids about good sex and about having good sex in deeply loving relationships because that's just all wrong. And people will accuse you of terrible things. But if you want to conduct your very own study on this, go to Rome. Okay, you will see a lot of very hot women with little kids, really nice cleavage showing. You know, you can go to other parts of the world and this is not such a dominant thing. This is all about living in the land of the pilgrims and the Puritans. And for both men and women, God help you if you try to move into that state of androgyny where you feel your masculine and feminine energy together and you use it in your sexual practice. This is very terrifying to people. This is starting to change more and more and I'm happy about it, but the shifts are very regionally specific. If you live in New York, great. If you live in uh, San Francisco, terrific. Try doing this in middle America, like Oklahoma or something. Okay, now what ends up happening is this is what I'm dealing with all the time when people come in and they say, I've lost my sense of desire, I can't grab a hold of my sexual pleasure, I don't know where my appetite has gone. But yeah, okay, yeah, we have sex a couple times a week, so it's probably not so bad. Yeah, but how do you feel about it? Are you enjoying it? Do you feel you can access your sexual desire? Where is your libidinal energy and how can you activate it? How can you get it back to where you want it to be? And one of the things I do in a lifestyle assessment is evaluate what is this person's pleasure indices? Because you know we are a culture that's very reliant on productivity for feeling good about who we are. And I say, who we? Because guess what? None of us leave here alive. I mean, we have talked about this at this conference, but I'm saying it in a different way. None of us leave here alive, and you better be enjoying yourself and you better have those sacraments of pleasure well infused into everything you do, or else if you want your sexuality to be there, it won't be unless you have those things. Now, why do these imbalances occur and persist? Well, you know, for women it's difficult to feel sexually entitled because what we hear all the time when we start being introduced to content around sexual behavior and sexual uh, activity is a shame-based model, it's a terrorist-based curriculum, don't you dare have sex, you will get pregnant. You will get a sexually transmitted infection. That's absurd, it's ridiculous. And if kids are well informed, they, I mean, trust me, the last person who wants an unplanned pregnancy is someone who's 15. That's the last person. And so when we train our girls around sexual health issues, we need to say to them, I want you to enjoy your body as safely as you can. There's no such thing as safe sex because you can get a broken heart, you can get a sexually transmitted infection, you can end up having an untoward outcome. But I want you to enjoy your flesh, your skin. Let me teach you how to do that as safely as possible, as opposed to saying to them, don't have any sex at all, which shuts women down. And once women you know, complete their reproductive uh, cycle, as they have defined it, then they say, I hear this all the time, why should I have sex? I don't need to have sex. And all he wants is sex. Well, you know, a lot of times all he wants is you, <laughs> not really so much the sex, although that can come along with it, but you could enjoy yourself a little bit more. All right, many of us have had unloving parents and families. I work with many people who have never been hugged and kissed by their parents and never saw their parents hug and kiss one another. Again, they don't speak the language of affection. They certainly don't have fluency in it. And it's an all elbows event for them when they do try to be affectionate. The embarrassment that disables us from talking about sex is very, very serious. It's very serious and it's a big problem in this country and we have a public health crisis because of the choices that people make around sexuality. You know, it's really complicated, but we don't talk about it. We talk around it. We talk around HIV, you know, issues and sexually transmitted infections and we put it in really clinical terms, but we don't deal with the issue of the psychology that's imposed on the behavior. A sense of obligation, especially for women, and this is tied to uh, number five, and here's how it shows up in my office. A woman comes in and she says, I'd like you to help me have better sex with my husband. Okay, tell me something that's going on, you know, give me some, some idea of the features of the relationship. She starts talking and then viscerally, I can feel that I'm not getting the information I need. 
you know, as a midwife, I have had to really cultivate and refine my intuition because, you know, I have one, I always have two patients minimum and one of them is in a cave and can't speak, all right? So I have to intuit from the situation what's happening. So I'll say to her, okay, well, hold on a second. How do you feel about your partner? And it always ends up like this. <sighs> well, I'm not really attracted to him. I've lost a lot of respect for him, and I don't really like spending time with him. Uh-huh. So let me paraphrase this for you. You're asking me to help you have hot sex with somebody that you're not attracted to, you don't like, and you don't respect. He is a wonderful guy. He would give me anything. He adores me. And I say, yeah, okay, I'm down with that, but it's really hard to have what you want under those conditions. And then every single time, she says to me, well, don't you have toys and positions you can recommend? Yeah, and in this case, I can recommend a blindfold, and I can recommend that you're on your hands and knees facing the wall, and you put in earplugs so you have no idea who it is behind you. <laughs> That's what I can recommend. This is not a sexual health issue. This is a crisis of integrity. And unless you go back to those markers of emotional well-being, you won't be able to figure that out. Because in that case, how that woman feels about herself, her health-seeking behaviors, all of those things have everything to do with it. And then, of course, she says, you know, I just don't feel like having sex as much as he wants. I'm thinking, of course you don't, you dope. Okay, anyway. <laughs> All right, so what do you do now? I mean, I've given you all this information that's so different than alleles, you know, and so different from patient advocacy, and I just don't know what's gonna happen by the end of this. Anyway, okay, so what do you do now? Well, people who know that I'm a sexuality counselor may think that I have this penchant, that I'm on this campaign to make sure people have as much sex as they possibly can. No, that, that's not where it is, you know, and I always say that if at 52, and I have a same-sex partner who's 57, if we were as sexually active now as we had been when we first got together almost 20 years ago, we would both be in the ICU on vents, okay, because we would drop dead. I couldn't keep up with my younger self. So what I want people to do is to claim that they have a sexuality, that it's important, and that whatever they decide to do with it they do it with consciousness. So if you say to me, I've left my partner, that was my true beloved, and I don't want to share that with anyone else anymore, and I only have self-pleasuring in my life, I say, fine, I'm not here to talk you out of that. But when I hear people say, I don't want to talk about sex, I hate sex, I don't, if I never have sex again, I won't notice. How's that possible? You will never notice that you've never had sex again? So there's something wrong in that, to me. It's troubling, because it's supposed to be a deeply pleasurable experience, at least as I understand it, personally and professionally. Uh, so I just hope that people will claim their sexual energy is important. Remember, the hardest person to talk to about sex is the person you have sex with. Why? Because whoever taught you how. And you know, the interesting thing about this as a sexual educator, and some of you know that, that my first book that's out is about raising sexually healthy teen girls, is that we do all sorts of mentoring with our children. We make sure that they're good readers, and we make sure they know how to uh, do good dental hygiene, and we teach them all sorts of other things, how to use a checkbook and how to save money, but we never teach them any sort of good communication that's fluent and satisfactory about sexuality, and that's why it's so hard to talk to the person you have sex with. You have to move out of the brainiac life. And this is especially important for this audience of scientists because you spend a lot of time in really every other part of your brain other than your limbic brain. And it's your limbic brain that you're going to have sex with, and it's your limbic brain that's your epicenter of pleasure and of satisfaction and of intuition. And how do you do that? How do you feed your limbic brain? You listen to all different kinds of music, and you know that Lil' Kim, who's a personal favorite, is going to move you in a very different way than Maria Kala singing an aria. Okay, and you go back to what I refer to as the master. You know, some of you might have portraits of Einstein in your, you know, in your offices or someone else. I have Barry White, okay? <laughs> Barry White is the master in my field. 
uh, and you eat foods that you like. You know, I, I, it's very hard for me to admit to people that I don't like salad. I hate salad. I hate it. I don't care if it's good for me. I'm not eating it. That's the end of it. I don't like it. I like cooked vegetables. I grew up in a Mediterranean household. Salad to us is cucumbers and tomatoes, not lettuce. That's for rodents, okay? We don't eat salad. So, you know, I only eat food that I like. I may eat more of it than I should, but, you know, we all are flawed. Okay, and I do like to dance, and I, I uh, it's true. I take Middle Eastern dance. And oftentimes my fat moves in one direction and I move in the other, but I don't care. I really don't care because it infuses me with something that feels really good to me. And music that was my first music growing up. And that's part of what I like. I love those Middle Eastern rhythms. And I laugh as much as I possibly can because, oh God, there's not enough humor in this, li in this lifetime for all of us to cope with the levels of suffering that we as individuals endure and that we see other people endure. There's nothing wrong with humor as long as it's not at your own, as, as, as long as it's not at somebody else's expense. And I have plenty of my own things to laugh about. And if you're really struggling, I suggest that people work with a sex counselor or a therapist who does the kind of work that I do. Uh, there aren't very many of us. There aren't enough of us. And part of what I bring to my discipline and practice is that I have a long history of working in medicine. So when people come in and they have all sorts of physical problems or they're on a whole host of medications, I can better understand how they might be feeling about their bodies, their sexuality, their genitals. I know when they say to me, I'm on this, this, and this medication, I know what those are and I know what the side effects profile uh, is likely to be. So I, um, I, I, I cannot thank you enough for, um, for listening to this. Uh, and if you have questions or are wondering what on earth I was doing here, then you have to talk to Larry. <laughs> so. Thank you. Are you all too afraid to ask a question? Um, hello. Hello. Uh, I read a study once, uh, and the conclusion of the study was that anger increased fertility in women. And I was wondering if you'd ever heard about that and what the implications of that might be. Well, this reminds me of conversations that I've had with someone who I have incredible affection for, and that's Fenton Steele. And he always reminds me about, uh, you know, our, my mammalian heritage and the fact of being an animal, and I think it probably brings out the beast in us, you know, when we're angry, literally. And I think that ovulatory cycles can actually absolutely, I mean, that is one time when endocrine function can absolutely impact behavior and drive. And some women will say to you that they feel more angry when they're ovulating and they're mid-cycle and they go for their partner, well, clearly in a heterosexual relationship, but otherwise as well. So it wouldn't surprise me. I haven't read that study, but... Might, might that explain the repression of women and patriarchy? Oh, I'm sure that's a piece of it. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Yes, there's someone way up there. Okay. Yeah, well, you know, I do know about this idea and the asceticism and celibacy. I feel like this is a very personal choice for people. It's not for me to, um, to direct people in those ways. One of the things I'm concerned about with that, however, is that, and this is where, you know, my own uh, ethnic background comes in and my own personal experience. When people in this dimension, as we know it, work very, work very diligently to transcend, as they say, and to move to other dimensions, I say, oh, don't be so quick to leave. You know, because there's a lot of pleasure here and there's a lot of pleasure in your body that you can access and why don't you stay, stick around? Like, 
Maybe you don't need to transcend, you know, uh, and maybe you're transcending for the wrong reasons, but I feel like the pleasures that are available to us are deep and wide and vast and incredibly therapeutic. So I'm not the strongest advocate for asceticism and transcendental experiences. I say, whoa, move into that body of yours and love every minute of it. And even if you're not part ha experiencing partnered sex, have a self-pleasuring practice because that can be deeply satisfying and perfectly enough for some people. Yes? Yes. Right. Two hours. Yeah. 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 I've seen that, yeah. <laughs> yes, well, let me, let me give you um, an interesting answer to that that you probably wouldn't have expected. I worked with a man for a while who I just had such affection for, and, um, and he, had, he, he is naturally a right-handed, right-hand dominant person, but was so, was so uh, tortured with guilt about self-pleasuring throughout childhood and into early adulthood that he actually trained himself to masturbate with his left hand because he was afraid that if he shook someone's hand that they somehow would know. And so now he cannot, he came to me because he felt like he needed to retrain himself and I said, don't be ridiculous. I said, if you have a, you know, if you're successful with your left hand, just call yourself determined. I mean, I. I, you know, I, I had no interest in changing his mind or his practice. But I think that, that really the, the school system is not where we need to look. The, the place where we need to look is at our own dinner tables and breakfast tables and in our own conversations in the home because we fundamentally, by example and conversation, are our children's best teachers. And, you know, for my entire time having young children in the house and saying all sorts of things to them, that other people, you know, were just appalled by. I just hammered away at it and I would say things that other people I knew would never say to their children because I wanted to de-emphasize the forbidden fruit experience of sex. You know, the forbidden fruit is the sweetest. And I felt that it was my obligation early on to train my kids and also both my partner and I are nurse midwives so it wasn't uncommon when the phone rang or when our beepers went off for our kids to be at the table and hear us say things like, well, how, when did it come out of your vagina? Oh, my God, you put your birth control pill in your vagina instead of your mouth? I mean, <laughs> that's not how it works. You know, we, our kids heard all kinds of things growing up, and it normalized the experience of being sexually intimate adult people or teenage people. Um, so I, I personally think that the obligation and the onus of responsibility lies in each of us as parents. And by the way, it's never too late. And you don't even have to speak it because one of the best recommendations I have about masturbation and same-sex practice, or I mean, uh, well, that too, but um, <laughs> masturbation is if you want to encourage your kids to do this and they're teenagers and you can't speak it and they don't want to hear you say it, is you create a flashcard system. And I did this once with my daughter. I took a big piece of paper and I wrote on it, remember, Masturbation is sex too, it is a lot of fun, it's great and free. And I folded it up and I put it on her mirror in her bathroom and it had her name on it. She thought it was a really cool note. She opened it and went, what? <laughs> and she's never forgotten it. And I would venture to say she probably does self-pleasure. I mean, when we talk about communicating about sex, it's not just through our conversation and voices. You can write, you can hold up pictures, you can hide behind a book and say, I can't really talk about this, but 
I really want you to know it. It's so important. None of us are perfect at this conversation. And just to give you an idea, I mean, I, I have this weird obliviousness about my personality at times. And I don't know, I was lost in thought. I was in the supermarket with my daughter when her full-fledged sexiness was coming to the surface. I, wanting her to be empowered as a woman and sexually active woman, said to her in a very audible voice, Thalia, how are your orgasms? And she looked at me. She knows this thing about my obliviousness. She said, Mom, we are in a supermarket, and I'm going to talk to you about that later. <laughs> and I realized, oh my god, this was so inappropriate. I mean, talk about being hopelessly flawed, you know. So, yeah. One last question. No, I'm not. <laughs> but thanks for asking. Um, so I, I, I have to take a somewhat oppositional thing because of my relationship with the other Larry. So I worry about our culture, particularly our commercial culture, being overly sexualized and, and too much, especially I have a, a nine-year-old daughter. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'm a little concerned about all of the sexual images and the stuff in, in dolls and TV and music videos right. and, and the like. And I, I sort of want to try and rescue uh, sexuality from something that's used for those sorts of purposes, commercial, selling, whatever, from the ones you talked about. Could you give us a little insight into how you deal with that? Yeah, stuff? absolutely. Um, what, I, what I feel about this is people will often ask me a question like this in the, in the information age, how do we manage this as parents of young children, sexual innuendo is everywhere, graphic sexual image is all over the place. And my feeling is that we have an obligation for their sake and ours, to identify smut as smut and to identify violence as it's associated with sex as violence and to be able to differentiate that for our children. Okay, so I'll give you an example. You know, uh, there's, an, there's a, w a website, I can't remember the name of it, but it's, it's, a, it's a scatological website that has to do with eroticism and, and feces. I mean, this is not my thing, uh, and uh, I assure you. And, um, and so when my, when my kids were really taken by it, you know, this bizarre curiosity thing, I took a deep breath and I said, okay, here's the deal. I understand that you guys are sort of curious about this, but here's the fact. This is disgusting, and it's really, you know, it's really not okay. And the communicable diseases, I took the science part, Communicable diseases that you could be exposed to through scat and feces are just, they're just countless. So something tells me you could find something with a better aroma and, uh, and, a, and, and a better texture to get yourselves turned on. So I can tolerate this on the internet for a little bit because I know you're curious, but get a grip. You know, and so there's a way that we have to call things what they are. The Sports Illustrated issue uh, of, you know, bathing suits, perfect example. Use this one. Okay, the issue comes in, and your kids say, whoa, she is so hot. Look at how hot these women are. And what I said in response to it when I saw it one time with my kids is I said, eh, not bad for fake. And they said, what do you mean? I said, these women don't walk the face of the earth. They're graphically altered. Look at her neck. She looks like a giraffe. You see those breasts? Those aren't real breasts. Trust me, I've seen hundreds of thousands of women's breasts. They're not perky like that. Have you studied gravity yet in middle school? <laughs> Has an effect. Okay, all these things that we can say and that we should say about stuff helps them really absorb our, our feelings about what healthy sexuality is. And this is not to degrade people who may have fetishes or, you know, but remember, again, is coercion a feature here? Is coercion a component? And think of that as a guiding force. And, you know, I mean, to say, oh, my God, we have the Internet and we're inundated and I don't know what to do is like saying, I think we should uninvent the telephone. We're not going to uninvent the Internet. The, the onus of responsibility is on those of us raising children who we know are exposed to this to be able to talk about it openly and to be able to say, this stuff is dangerous and here's why. Women are being exploited against their will 
There's a violent component here that's not okay. This is not consensual adult BDSM. This is some poor woman from Brazil who's in a snuff film. And you know what? She's dead now, really. You see what I mean? And we're afraid to get near this stuff. It's very, very sensitive stuff. But the more we practice it, the easier it becomes. Thank you very much. Thank you.